I want to just remind you, if you happen to be new to the summer webinar series we've been doing, I want to say good morning to you, good afternoon, wherever you may be watching us from. We're so excited to have you here with us. Uh, this is a summer webinar series we've been doing for the Advanced Leadership Institute, which is an amazing program that kicks off this fall, it kicks off honestly in the next few weeks. Uh, it's going to be a 10-month deep dive into some leadership training, some really good, great uh, leadership coaching, leadership deep dive information with some amazing faculty. You'll be with a different faculty member kind of every month is how it's set up. It's really designed to help you become the best leader that you can be to release the potential that's inside of you, regardless of which area you may be leading in. You're going to be hearing from leaders of ministries, entrepreneurs, people who have been executive coaches, people from all facets and all walks of life. So it's going to be an amazing opportunity for you to just grow as a leader. You'll also receive a diploma from Van Moody Ministries when you finish the program. Let me tell you about some of the great faculty you'll be hearing from. You'll be hearing from Dr. Kenneth Omer, uh, Dr. Matthew Hester, DeAndre Salter, Dr. Sam Chan, Martine Van Tilbor, Wayne Chaney, my, his wife, Maisha Chaney, Sean Lovejoy, myself, some of our newer faculty members, Zakia Larry, Dr. Nicola Beach. This is just some amazing, amazing people who have great life experiences and they're bringing what they've learned through their fields of expertise, what they've learned about leadership over the past 10, 20, and 30 years to the table, to this program so that you can uh, draw inspiration from it, you can draw wisdom from it, and begin growing in your leadership. So we're really excited about this Advanced Leadership Institute program uh, that's kicking off soon. It's Let me give you a little bit of format. We'll talk on the back end as well what the Leadership Intent Institute looks like. It's, it's web-based, so it's very much uh, you can go at your own pace, your own flexibility during the week, what times work best for you. During the modules, you have the ability to learn and interact with some of these faculty members, uh, which is going to be very, very beneficial for you. You're going to do some book learning through the modules through the month. You're going to have access to a growing resource library. Uh, again, it's just an amazing, amazing program. And so as we get prepared for the launch of the Advanced Leadership Institute, we really wanted to make sure that we continue to add value to you to help you continue to grow through these summer months. So this is the third of three summer webinars that we're doing. Today we've got an amazing uh, topic as we talk about uh, the leadership, the test of leadership. And uh, Pastor Van is here with us. Van Moody is an amazing leader. We're excited and honored to have him speaking to us for a few minutes today. So as we get ready to kick off, I'm going to, some of you have just joined in recently, so I'm going to post that link to the notes again, just in case. I'll post them a few times throughout today's webinar, but I'm going to post them again there in the chat box. If you've joined us just over the last few minutes, please open up your chat window. We're going to be taking any questions. I'll be fielding those in the chat window while Van talks to us today about the test of leadership. We're really excited. Michael, I see you got your hand up. Not sure if you're needing to ask a question, so I'm going to lower your hand if you would. If you got a question, pop over to the chat box. Uh, there will be a replay, just like we've done for this summer webinar series. Afterwards, we'll send you the notes. We'll send you the webinar replay link. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll make sure you get that afterwards as well. Just check the same email address that you got the invitation for this webinar in. All right, so it's five after. I think we're about ready to roll uh, without further introduction without further ado van moody is here with us one of our great heads of this leadership institute program um, i'm honored to serve alongside of him and, and have learned so much the last two years of being a part of his team here at the worship center so we're excited to have him with us today excited to open up what it means to really uh live through and thrive in the test of leadership so van take it away bud all right well, thank you, Jason, and good afternoon, good morning to some of you. I know that we've got people that are joining us literally from around the world, and so no matter what part of the globe uh, you are in, uh, good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. Excited uh, to share with you today. Forgive uh, my background. I am uh, in the midst of finishing up uh, my brand new book and getting ready to hand it in to the publisher in uh, a week or so, and so what you see behind me is uh, my desk in my home office where I do a ton of writing, and so it is in total disarray. This is what it looks like in the writing process, and uh, as soon as the book is done, things will kind of go back to normal. But I'm excited because I wanna share something with you that 
it's taken me some time to fully get my arms around. One of the things that I'm excited about with the Leadership Institute is that we're going to share uh, an uh, uh, overwhelming, at times it probably will feel like that, an overwhelming amount of, of truths and nuggets to help you be a better leader. And some of what you're going to get from me and uh, other faculty members is not just head knowledge. Um, they're things that we've learned over the years and sometimes, unfortunately, by trial and error. One of the things that I talk about if you go out to the Advanced Leadership Institute page is a part of the reason why I felt so called to create uh, this leadership uh, environment is because having studied at some great universities, I realized that once I got into full-time leadership, you know, leadership in business and in ministry and even in coaching other leaders, I realized that there was just a ton that school didn't teach me. And I think that there needs to be a forum and an opportunity like the Advanced Leadership Institute to really continue uh, the educational journey and development that I think schools will start, but they in and of themselves won't complete it. And so I'm going to share something with you called the test of leadership. And once again, this is something that I didn't learn in school. This is something that I learned uh, really uh, through the trial of hard knocks over the last 25 year plus uh, journey that I've been on in leadership. And quite honestly, I wish that it was something that someone would have taught me years ago. Had I learned this years ago, it would have saved me um, a lot of headache. It would have put a number of things in perspective. It would have helped me to understand what to focus on and what to let go of. One of the true secrets of leadership is learning what to focus on because there are a number of things that will be vying for your attention and a lot of them are not nearly as important as some of the other ones. And so this test of leadership took me a while to get my arms around because I had to go through them. And so what I'm going to give you are uh, the, the tests that all leaders will go through. And you won't go through them in a linear fashion. You won't uh, go through one and move on to the next and think, man, I'm done with that. These tests are random. Uh, but all leaders will go through them, and sometimes you'll go through them in a cyclical fashion, meaning every so many years or throughout the different seasons of your leadership, you will endure this test and maybe another test, but they're the tests that all leaders go through. And just like passing a test or taking a test, uh, you got to pass it in order to move on to the next thing. So let me talk for a second about the importance of testing. Uh, one of the examples I love to use is what happened in 2014 with General Motors. In 2014, General Motors had to recall somewhere in uh, somewhere around 39 million, maybe close to 40 million vehicles, uh, really worldwide. And the reason for this recall was because there were a number of cars and trucks and SUVs that simply had not been thoroughly tested. And unfortunately, this caused a lot of deaths. And many of these deaths were linked to faulty ignition switches and General Motors ended up having to pay families that lost loved ones hefty fines. And in addition to what they had to pay and damages to family members, the company itself, the brand of General Motors sustained critical uh, damage to its credibility and to its brand. There were a number of people that lost faith in the once reputable company. And the point is, all of that could have been avoided had General Motors simply put their vehicles through a proper testing process. Now, I love to tell that story because what it does is it illustrates how important testing is, not just for General Motors and car manufacturers, but it's the same thing for us. And a truth that we don't really talk about is that God is so committed to his will for your life and his purpose for your life, that often God will not release you to your next step of destiny until he knows that you are ready for it. And the way that you prove your readiness is by how you effectively pass these tests. And you see this in scripture. One of the uh, examples that I gave in the notes, and I hope that all of you have the notes uh, and follow along with me as I'm sharing this, but Paul says this to Timothy, and this is in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 10. 
when he talks about people who want to be in leadership positions in their local church. He says that they first have to be proved, and that word prove literally means they have to be tested. He says, Timothy, don't be too quick to elevate or promote anybody. You've got to make sure that they've been tested first. And then there's also a verse of scripture that is really near and dear to my heart and is Hebrews 12 and verse one. And many of you know it, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And it goes on to say, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what's interesting is that what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's painting a vivid picture for us about leadership. And he's literally saying that you and I have a race to run. But while we're running our race, we are doing what we're called to do and running our race in an arena, if you will. And the arena is packed out with the leaders that have gone on before us, you know, the entrepreneurial leaders, the business leaders, the faith leaders that have gone on to glory. They have run their race, their season on this type, on this side of heaven uh, is, is up and they are now in glory. And the writer of Hebrews is painting this picture that they're in the stands, right? And that they are cheering us on as you and I run our race. But what's also implied in this is that they're watching us handle the test of leadership that they themselves had to handle. So they're cheering for us, not just to run around the arena, but to jump the hurdles at the same time. Uh, I ran track in, in high school and uh, in middle school, ran for many, many years. And that's the thing, particularly if you ran the hurdles, it wasn't just the speed with which you could run, it was your ability to get over the hurdles at the same time. And that's really what leadership is. It is not just about your effectiveness in an area, your giftedness, your talent, your speed, your business acumen. It's also about how successfully you navigate the hurdles or the test that come to every leader. So I wanna take the rest of our time together and I wanna talk about these tests. I wanna define what these tests of leadership are uh, and I want to give you these definitions and really the purpose behind the test. And then I'll also give you some biblical examples because it really doesn't matter what type of leader you are. You may be a leader in ministry. You may be a leader in the marketplace. Uh, you may sense that you're called to leadership, but maybe you don't feel like you're fully leaning into that yet. It doesn't matter. All leaders are going to go through these types of tests. And so as I'm walking through it, what I want you to do is I want you to think about where you are right now, because as I describe these tests to you, it's going to be really clear in, in, in uh, the lives of many of you. You're going to say, I, this is where I am right now. Some of you are going to say, oh, that's what that was. Some of you are going to recognize that, you know what, I think that this is what was going on at a period in my life, and I didn't understand it. I didn't have the frame of reference to really kind of put my arms around it. And some of you will gain the knowledge you need for what's up ahead. So let's take a second and let me just walk you through these tests. There are 15 of them. And so I won't have time to spend a whole bunch of time on all of them, but I just want to describe them to you so that you will understand these tests. So number one, and I hope that you have your notes with you because I just want to walk through them and uh, hopefully you can write in your notes if you had time to, uh, to download those notes and print them out. Uh, so let's get started. The first test of leadership, and once again, they will not come necessarily in a particular order, but I wanted to share them with you in a particular order, I think, to help better uh, make sure that you guys at least understand it and comprehend it and apply it to your own life. But often you will experience these tests out of order. So there's no rhyme or reason to it. The, the, the only pattern is that there is no pattern. So let's talk about it. Number one is the time test. The time test. So let me tell you what the time test is. When you are going through the time test, it's going to look like God is not fulfilling the word that he gave you at some point in the past. All of us will get direction and instruction and inspiration from God for whatever area we're called to address and lead. But when you go through the time test, you're going to feel like, well, wait a minute, where I am doesn't look anything like what you said. And the time test is going to test your patience. 
and it's going to force you to trust God to fulfill his word in his own way and in his own time. That's why it's the time test. Now, there's a purpose to this test. The purpose of the time test is to grow you in your faith. Because all leaders have a measure of faith and trust, right? All leaders to get started, you, you feel great about your gift, you feel great about your calling, and you say, okay, I'm ready to do this. Uh, and so every leader has a measure of faith and trust. But what God desires to do over time is to grow our trust in him to the point that we trust him with every detail of our life. And that's a part of the purpose of the time test. During this test, what God is going to do is he's going to purify your motives. He's going to purify your attitude. And he's going to demonstrate his faithfulness and his power. And now this is critical because a lot of leaders think that we can just make things happen. You know, we are overly confident at times with our gifts and our abilities. And it leads us to think, man, that, that we can just make it happen. But during the time test, what will often happen is that God will bring us to the end of ourselves, right? Well, we realize that, man, I've tried everything that I know to do and it's not happening. And when you come to the end of yourself, that's when God will step in and that's when he's going to move in a greater way. A biblical example of this is Abraham. And I put the scripture references there in your notes. And so you can go back and, and read those chapters and those verses in your own time. But if you know the story of Abraham, you remember that it took 25 years. In Genesis 12, when God called him, Abraham was 75 years old. Um, when he finally has Isaac, He's a hundred years old and that time is purposeful because if you know the story, you know that like many of us, Abraham and Sarah take matters in their own hands and think that they could just make it happen. And that's where Ishmael comes from. But God says, no, 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 this is going to happen in my own time uh, and my own way. And so Abraham is a perfect example of the time test. The second test is the word test, the word test. Now, the word test is interesting because during the word test, you're going to experience circumstances and events that will appear to nullify the word of God. So when you're going through the word test, what God has said and what you're actually experiencing are going to look like they're complete opposites. They're going to look like they're diametrically opposed to one another. And here's what you have to understand. God purposefully will sometimes allow that contradiction or that appearance of a contradiction because what he's doing is he's accomplishing certain purposes that at the time we don't really know and we don't understand. But God hasn't contradicted or forgotten his word. And, and that's a word of encouragement for some of you today. Because if you can endure this test, what you're going to eventually find is that at the end, you're going to say, God, I thank you because. Man, the way you worked this out was so much better than what I had in mind. So the purpose of the word test in many instances is to cause you and I as leaders to reject our own resources, our own ingenuity, and to simply completely depend on God's strength and God's providence to bring his word to pass. A biblical example of this is Joseph. You can go back and look at the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 through Genesis 45. Joseph gets a word from God. I mean, a tremendous word. But then automatically, out of nowhere, the circumstances of his life look completely different from what God spoke to him. And in addition to that, Joseph ends up having to wait 14 years to see the fulfillment of God's word to him. But I love what Psalm 105 and verse 17, 18, and 19 lays out about what God was doing. Because remember, I told you that even though it will appear like there's a contradiction, it's really not because there's certain purposes that God is accomplishing, sometimes behind the scenes that we're not aware of at that time. And that's what Psalm 105 helps us to really understand, even about what God was doing in Joseph's life. In Psalm 105 and verse 17, it says, He sent a man before them. So Joseph was thinking, what, what are you doing, God? Right? He's scratching his head, like, what, what's going on? But there was something much bigger than Joseph individually going on. And it says that he sent a man before them. He's talking about the nation of Israel who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord, look at this, 
tested him. So Joseph was undergoing the word test. Here's the third test of leadership, the character test. This is a big one. And as, as a matter of fact, if you read my book, The People Factor, in one chapter in particular, I talk a little bit about the character test and I tell my own story about when I was going through the character test. But during the character test, uh, leaders are going to be sometimes surrounded uh, by ungodliness. And uh, maybe it's the behavior of people, maybe it's their lifestyle that you're around, but that ungodliness that you're going to find yourself around will attempt to pull you in its direction. Meaning when you're going through the character test as a leader, you're going to be tempted in a variety of ways, largely because of the environment that you find yourself in, meaning you will find yourself as a leader in environments that maybe are not necessarily conducive to character, real character development. And part of the reason that God sends us through these tests is because in order to develop uh, leaders with strong, godly character, leaders with integrity, leaders that are the kind of people that God wants them to be for where he's ultimately trying to take them, what God does to develop that in us is that he will place us in fiery situations that are designed to force us to learn how to stand strong in him. Meaning that when you are going through the character test, what God is doing is he's trying to determine, are you willing to stand firm in him or are you easily swayed by what's happening around you? The purpose of the character test is also important too, because one of the things that God does during the character test is that God will reveal the areas in our own lives where we're weak. The truth is every leader has hidden character deficiencies. And a lot of times we're unaware of these character deficiencies until we're confronted with a specific situation or circumstance that demands a godly response. And so in many ways, God uses the character test to expose the true inner self to every leader. Meaning that God says, okay, I'm going to put you in a situation that's going to place a demand on your character for you to really see the deficiencies within your own character. And I forgot to say this at the top, but I want to insert it here. The thing about maturity is that maturity has to have a demand placed on it. There are a lot of people who say, oh, I'm mature or I've been in leadership all of these years. A real maturity has to have a demand placed on it, meaning that's a part of the reason why God sends us through these tests, because these tests, depending on whether you pass them or fail them, are really placing a demand on your maturity as a leader. Now, a biblical example of the character test is Samuel. If you know anything about the background or the backdrop of what's happening during the time when Samuel is being mentored by Eli, then you know that Eli is wicked. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are wicked. And so really the background or the environment out of which Samuel grows into a leader is that he's surrounded by nothing but wickedness and disobedience and unfaithfulness. He's surrounded with people that are not character people. And Samuel has to make a choice. Either he's going to go in the direction of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, or he's going to stand firm in God. And we know the end of the story is that he ultimately decides to stand firm in God. And so he's a great example of the character test. Sometimes as leaders, we want the perfect environment. And let me say this to you. Sometimes God won't do that for you. He won't put you in the perfect environment. Uh, some of the greatest ways that God will teach us what to do is by putting us in environments that show us day in and day out what not to do. That's what the character test is about. The fourth test is the motivation test. The motivation test is designed to reveal your true inner intentions, your, your true inner thoughts and values and priorities that ultimately lead us to act in certain ways. Sometimes as leaders, the truth is we don't always know why we do certain things. And sometimes there is a disconnect as leaders uh, between our outward and our inner motives. Sometimes uh, leaders just mimic what they've seen other leaders do. I often tell the story about um, a husband and wife who got into an argument because the wife always cut the back of uh, the ham off. Uh, when she was preparing it to go into the oven. 
and the husband says, why do, why do you cut the back of the ham off? I mean, that's, that's, that's good meat. Like you're wasting, you're wasting food. And she responded and says, man, you don't know what you're talking about. My mother has always done it this way. And, and this is the way we cook ham. And he said, yeah, I get that. But something's not right here because you're cutting off the back of the ham and, and you're wasting food. You ought to go talk to your mom. And so she does. She says, uh, mom, uh, you know, my husband and I got into an argument about this. And I told him, you cut the back of the ham off. That's the way we prepare it. I'm just doing what you did. And, and her mom responds to her and says, yeah, well, I did it that way because my grandmother did it that way. So you really need to talk to your grandmother. She goes and talks to her grandmother. And she says, grandmother, please help me understand why you cut the back of the ham off. Mom said she started cooking ham like that because that's what you did. I cook ham like that because that's what I saw mom did, do. Explain to me why. And she said, well, baby, back then, grandma didn't have a pan large enough to fit the ham. So I had to cut the back of the ham off. And I tell that story because as leaders, often we just do what we've seen everybody else do and we never really ask the hard questions. Well, the purpose of the motivation test though is to get us to really wrestle with that. The purpose of the motivation test is to expose what drives us internally and why, and then to purify them so that ultimately our internal motivations bring glory to God. See, often as leaders, we lead more out of sometimes what we can get instead of what we can give. I know a number of leaders who are so enamored with themselves that that's their motivation. They want to be seen. They want to be applauded. They want people to recognize them. And God will send you through this motivation test because he wants to change your motivations. He wants to make sure that your motives are pure and that if you have the wrong motives, he replaces them with the right motives that every leader should have. A clear Bible example of this is the story of Balaam in Numbers 22, 23, and 24. The cliff note version of this story is that Balaam is motivated by money and he tries to do something that God clearly told him not to do. And so God, in some very clear ways and in some very supernatural ways, has to change his motivations until he finally gets in line with God's will for his life. That's the motivation test. The fifth, te the fifth test is the servant test. Now, this is the big one. Because in the servant test, a leader is often asked to do what they will perceive to be something that is a menial task, something that is below or beneath their gifts and their talents. Now, let me just insert something here. In truth, no task should ever be beneath a real leader. But in the servant test, as a leader, you're going to be asked or challenged to do something that you think is beneath you. And the purpose of the servant test is that it reveals the heart of a leader. As a leader, do you really just want to be seen? Do you want to be in the public eye? Do you want to be served? Or do you want to make a difference and help others and serve? And that's what comes out in the servant test. See, God will use the servant test to develop the understanding in the hearts of leaders of really what they ought to be focused on, you know? And then the other thing about the servant test too is that God will help you as a leader to understand certain aspects of the people that you're going to be called to lead. And as leaders, you can't really fully understand the real aspects of people that you're called to give leadership to unless you walked in their shoes. So an example of the servant test is the show Undercover Boss. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but they take a CEO of a major corporation and that CEO goes undercover and works in different areas of that corporation. And then at the end, there's this big reveal. And often the CEO's whole mindset changes and they end up doing really kind things to their employees. And what happens is that the CEO goes through the servant test. The CEO prior to that servant test has no understanding, you know, about what somebody in the mailroom or someone uh, in a different level is going through. So that leader makes assumptions or makes decisions without really being in tune to what those other individuals that are employees of the organization has gone through. And so often as leaders, we will make that mistake. We will make calls. We will make decisions. We will even jump to conclusions and make assumptions and have no idea what else is going on. And so 
John will take us through the servant test to make sure that our heart is right, but then also give us understanding about what others may be going through. A great example of this is Elisha in 1 Kings 19. When Elijah meets Elisha, he is plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. And so right away, what Elijah sees, which leads to him throwing his cloak on Elijah, on Elisha, he sees that Elisha is already in the posture of a servant. And, and so, so much more is there, but for the sake of time, I, I won't unpack it fully. You can go back and look at it on your own. The sixth test of leadership is the wilderness test. This is one that I spent a little bit of time talking about and writing about in my previous book, The I Factor. During the wilderness test, you're gonna find yourself in a desolate, dry place. And it may be desolate and dry emotionally, spiritually, financially, or in any other way. But this is the time where you really will look around and feel like there's no fruit, there is no tangible productivity. And often during the wilderness test, you will say things to God like, God, did I really hear you? Like, did I miss you? You know, but the purpose of the wilderness test is to determine whether or not you're going to trust God or try to take matters in your own hands. Real trust is proven during the wilderness seasons of your life. Real maturity is often displayed during the wilderness seasons of your life. And God will use the wilderness test to strip you of world's wisdom at the same time. While, while he's testing your maturity, testing whether or not you're gonna trust him or take matters into your own hands, he's also trying to strip you of worldly wisdom because often during the wilderness test, that's what we lean to. Well, this is what somebody did, or this is what people say I need to do during this season. But it's during the wilderness test that really the purpose of God is for you to lean into him and to quiet all of the other voices and only talk to him because the wilderness season is purposefully designed to prepare you for what is ahead. There are biblical examples of this. Moses endures the wilderness test, the nation of Israel. The Bible says God leads them the long way, takes them through the wilderness to prepare them for what is ahead. Jesus, right after he comes out of the Jordan River, after being baptized by John the Baptist, immediately he goes into the wilderness. And it says that the Spirit, Holy Spirit, drives him into the wilderness. And so the wilderness tests are purposeful. One of my favorite scriptures on this is Deuteronomy 8 and 10 that I also put in your notes. And it says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years for a couple of reasons, to humble you and test you. In order to know what was in your heart and whether or not you keep his commands, it's in those dry times, those desolate seasons where God says, now let me see what you're going to do. Are you going to trust me? Are you going to live for me? Are you going to tuck tail and run? That's the wilderness test. The seventh test of leadership is the misunderstanding test. Now, this is one that I know all too well. <laughs> the misunderstanding test happens when the people that you're called to lead, when they don't really understand what you're saying, and ultimately they will reject what you're trying to communicate. Um, this test happens when people misinterpret, mistake, or misunderstand the true intent of your words and your actions. Now, the purpose of this test is, is there are multiple reasons for this. Sometimes God will send us through this test because he's challenging us to look for new and better ways to communicate. You know, there's a disconnect sometimes between what we're trying to say and how it's received. But this test is also designed to humble us and to cause us to trust God in a greater way. Meaning after you've done everything you can to communicate it in the best way you humanly know possible and they still don't get it, they still misunderstand, there's still misinterpretation, then it also causes us to humble ourselves because maybe we're not as gifted a communicator as we think we are. And then it causes us to trust God in a more significant way. A clear biblical example of this is what happens with Jesus in John chapter six. Uh, it is a challenging chapter because Jesus feeds the 5,000. He goes on, those who ate the food go looking for him because they want more food. And then he really begins to teach about the fact that he is the bread of life. 
right? And he says that if you really want real bread and, and real food from which you'll never hunger again, he talks about how they have to eat of him. Now, they think that he's talking about cannibalism, but yet he's just talking about who he is. And that chapter is so, so chilling because it says that many disciples left Jesus at that time. Now, in truth, we don't know how many disciples Jesus started out with. We know that, that he ultimately had the 12, but in truth, he had many more than the 12. Because in John 6, it says that many disciples left. So imagine this. He's preaching a message, and you talk about the misunderstanding test. He preaches a message, and, and people don't get saved. People leave. I mean, like, people stand up and say, no, that's okay, Jesus. We don't want any of this. That's the misunderstanding test. It's also in Hebrews 12 and 3 when it says, you know, when you're going through difficulty, consider him who endeared who endured such hostility. That word hostility talks about, it means conflict and misunderstanding from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The writer of Hebrews is basically saying, before you throw in the towel and think that you're the only one going through this, please remember that Jesus went through it. The seventh test is the misunderstanding test. The eighth test is the patience test. The patience test. Now, the patience test happens when a leader expects, right, that God is going to move and he's going to do things on a certain schedule. The patience test happens when a leader's expectations in God are not fulfilled on your time frame. God, I need you to do it by now. Or God, I believe that you're going to do it by this time. And this time comes and God still hasn't done it. Now, interestingly enough, patience is one of the fruits of the spirit. But one of the things we often don't talk about is the fact that the word patience comes from the Latin word, which means to suffer. Yes. Like wrap that around your mind. That's what patience literally means. It comes from the Latin word that means to suffer. So in the patience test, God requires us to wait. And in waiting, we're going to endure some tribulation and some pain, but he wants us to endure it without complaining. The truth is to grow in patience, a leader must bear pain and trouble and difficulty without losing hope and without losing self-control and without complaining. Now, the purpose of the patience test is to get the leader, you and I, to yield everything to God. It is, it is designed to get you and I out of God mode, right? To get us away from this messianic complex and humble ourselves and fully yield every single thing to God. God, I fully yield it. I yield it over to you. And that's a big deal because often as leaders, we'll give some things right away. We'll give some things to God. We'll say, God, we trust you in some areas, but then there's still some areas we're holding on to that we want to make happen on our own time frame. A chilling example of this biblically is Noah. Go back in your own time and Look at Noah 5 chapters and look at the story of Noah in Genesis uh, 5, 6, and 7. God tells Noah to build an ark. He tells him it's going to rain. It's never rained before. And 120 years go by and it doesn't rain. So 120 years go by and Noah's building the ark. 120 years go by and Noah is preaching that it is going to rain. So wrap your mind around this for a second. Everybody that is alive during the time, the time of, Mo's, uh, of Noah, I was going to say during the days of Noah, they've never seen rain. Yet Noah says, it's rain, it's going to rain, guys. And, and so people are walking by saying, what in the world are you building? He says, oh, let me tell you what I'm building. I'm building an ark because it's going to rain. Noah did this for 120 years. He preached that it was going to rain for 120 years. Preached the same message. Nobody repented. Nobody came to God for 120 years. That's, that's a harsh one. Like, let me just talk to the pastors for a second. Could you handle it if nobody made a decision for Christ after you're preaching and teaching for 25 years? I mean, what if you preached your heart out for, for, for five years, 10 years, 15 years? Nobody came to the Lord. 
I know a number of pastors that would start thinking, maybe I'm not called to this. <laughs> you know, maybe this is not my will. God, maybe I, I didn't hear you right. But that's the weightiness of the patience test. So Noah is a great example of the patience test. The ninth test of leadership is the frustration test. A leader undergoes the frustration test when they feel like their life or their ministry goals ultimately can't be achieved. When, when you get to a place where you've been working hard, you've gone to every conference, you, you tried to do everything that you know to do, and it just feels like nothing is happening. And, and leaders will often go through the frustration test when they've done everything that they know to do and they cannot find any logical reason why their efforts aren't working. I mean, when you have racked your brain and you're saying now, uh, I crossed every T, I've dotted every I, I've done everything that I know to do and I just don't understand. I don't understand why it's not working. When you are at that place, you're going through the frustration test. And the purpose of this test is often to get the leaders to re-examine their priorities. Often God will bring us through this frustration test when there are priorities in our lives that need readjusting. And sometimes it's, it's not the business. Sometimes it's not the ministry. Sometimes it, it is not the thing that you think it is. Oftentimes the priorities that need to be readjusted or other things, maybe it's, maybe it's your family has not been tended to quite like you need it. Maybe personally, maybe your prayer time or your internal health it's not where it needs to be. And, and you're so focused about, okay, God, I want breakthrough with this. Like I, I, want, I want the business to go to the next level. I want, I want to increase my impact. But God is saying, yeah, but before I do that, I got to make sure that this thing over here is right. So that's the frustration test. Uh, the Apostle Paul is a great example of that. Um, I put the reference of 2 Corinthians 11. When you read through 2 Corinthians 11, one of the things that will jump out at you is that, that Paul is pretty upset and he's frustrated and going through this frustration test at that moment. Almost finished. Um, I want to see if I can get through all of these because I just want you to have them. Uh, and then I'd love for you to identify where you are or where you've been or maybe even where you think you're headed on uh, the range of these tests. The 10th test of leadership is the discouragement test. Now, this is a big one, and I know this one all too well. The discouragement test happens when a leader allows people in circumstances uh, to lead them into feeling just depressed or disheartened and ultimately discouraged so that they no longer have the courage. That's what discouraged literally means for what God has spoken. A discouraged leader often is deterred from pursuing God's will. You're so discouraged, you feel like, you know what, maybe I don't need to keep going down this road. And when you're in this season, when you're going through the discouragement test, often as a leader, you, you'll lose hope in God, you'll lose hope in his provision and his promises and ultimately his calling. Now, the purpose of the discouragement test is interesting because it's not that going through discouraging times uh, of stress and difficulty, it's not so much that that's wrong, but it's your attitude towards it that God is really trying to put on display. We're all going to go through times of discouragement and difficulty and stress, but the purpose of sending you through the discouragement test is to teach you as a leader, number one, how to respond to it. But then number two, the purpose is to teach us how to lean into God for joy and for peace and fulfillment, not people and not circumstances. There are a lot of leaders that are schizophrenic. Because when things are going well, you know, they're upbeat and they're positive and they, they have joy. But then when things are not going well, they're like, woe is me. I don't know what's going on. And, and, and God doesn't want you to be that way as a leader. So he will send you through these times of, of discouragement because he wants you to learn how to generate peace and joy and fulfillment from him. And when you learn how to do that, what people say to you, say about you, what happens to you circumstance wise, will never deter you from the peace and the joy and the fulfillment that God wants you to have. And so the purpose of the discouragement test is to teach you as a leader how to learn the importance of delighting yourself in the Lord and not people and not circumstances. A biblical example of this is Elijah in 1 Kings 19. It, it, it is always, that, that passage has always been baffling to me that Elijah goes from a showdown on Mount Carmel, right? He's on the top of Mount Carmel. And God rains down fire from heaven, 
450 false prophets of Baal wiped out. I mean, it's an amazing display of God's power. And then one word from Jezebel sends him from the mountaintop into utter despair to the point that he wants God to perform uh, ecclesiastical euthanasia. You know, he wants God to take his life. He just says, just, I'm, I'm done. Take, take my life. He, he goes from, I mean, breakthrough to ultimate discouragement. And the same thing that I just shared with you is what God walks him through. The 11th test of leadership is the warfare test, the warfare test. Now, this is uh, a significant test. And this is when, as leaders, you're going to experience significant spiritual opposition. And while it happens in the realm of the spirit, it often will manifest itself through conflicts with people or, or your work in a variety of ways. I mean, this is when it feels like everything has gone wrong and it's just come out of nowhere. And the purpose of this test is to force you and I as leaders to grow stronger in the spirit. I had a mentor that used to always tell me that the only way that you can get stronger is by picking up something heavy. And that's so true. The truth is, as leaders, I know a number of leaders who are gifted, but they're not mature. And one of the reasons they're not mature is because they just don't know how to win the war in the spirit. I mean, when the spiritual attack comes, they cave, they break down, they fall apart. But it's only through spiritual warfare that you learn how to use the weapons that you've been given and you learn how to exercise the authority that belongs to you. Biblical example of this is Timothy. This is why the language of Paul to Timothy in, in first and second Timothy is what it is. You know, uh, fight the good fight of faith and stand firm and don't let anybody look down on you because of your youth. I mean, Paul is telling Timothy, hey, you're going to have spiritual battles, but this is how you handle them. Because the warfare test is one of the tests of leadership. The 12th test of leadership is the self-will test. This is a big one. When a leader realizes that God is asking them to do something that goes totally counter to their plans and their desire, when that happens, the self-will test has begun. And let me tell you why this is so important to God, because God has to break every leader of their self-will and their personal ambition if they really want to be used of God in a great way. This is the only way that God is going to trust that leader with a significant kingdom assignment. And so the purpose of this test is to subject your will to his will. I often tell the story about how I never in a million years ever would have imagined that I'd be living in Birmingham doing ministry here. My dream, my desire, my self-will, my ambition was to be in my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia. That's what I wanted. And every opportunity that presented itself, I kept hitting a brick wall. God would not allow me to move beyond it and ultimately get to Atlanta until I finally died to self and said, okay, God, wherever you want me to go. I'll never forget the day I prayed that prayer. And I didn't pray it out of anger or frustration. I finally got to a place where my will was subjected to his will. And I said, God, wherever you want me to go, if it's to not even go beyond where I am right now, I'm at peace and I'm willing to serve you and do whatever you want me to do. The moment I got there in my heart, every door began to open. Biblical example of this is the difference between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 and Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26. Jesus is the second Adam because he does what Adam should have done. He makes right what Adam messed up. That's the self-will test. The 13th test of leadership, almost done is the vision test. I hope this has been a blessing for you. I've been trying to run through it really quickly. Um, and as I said at the top, I can't unpack all of these, but I just want you to at least be aware of what these tests are. Um, the 13th test of leadership is the vision test. The vision test is when what God has shown you is under attack. It's under attack by people and it's under attack by circumstances, meaning God has clearly given you a vision for your city, for your business, um, for what he's called you to, but everybody else doesn't see it. And the circumstances that you find yourself in will appear to be counter to it. The vision test is really designed to ask you two questions. Number one, do you see God's will for this situation or do you just see what everybody else sees? 
The second part is, can you resist the opposition and the adversity and hold fast to the vision? The purpose of the vision test is that number one, it will show you how empty your physical sight really is. And it will cause you to really lean into what God sees. It's like Ezekiel when God raises a question and says, son of man, can these bones live? That's the vision test. Because if Ezekiel would have responded based on what he physically saw, he would have failed that test. He says, God, only you know. In essence, show me what you see. Another example of this is Nehemiah uh, throughout the entire book of Nehemiah, but particularly Nehemiah chapter one, chapter two, and chapter four. The 14th test of leadership is the usage test. A leader will undergo the usage test when they feel like, man, I'm not being used as much as I'd like to. You know, nobody's inviting me here. I'm not getting into some of those open doors that maybe this person's getting through. When things aren't happening, uh, like you feel like they should be happening as it relates to people making a demand on your gift and your talent, you're in the usage test. Um, a lot of people, when you go through the usage test, they'll feel like, man, I feel like I'm on a shelf. And part of the reason that God will put us on a shelf and send us through the usage test is for growth. You know, sometimes God is trying to deepen his work in us so that what comes out of us uh, is even greater. Uh, sometimes God will put us on a shelf because the areas of our life that God still has to purify. Uh, sometimes God will put us on the shelf because the fire and the purpose is, is not really burning in your belly for what you're called to do. You're just doing it because you think you're supposed to be doing it, but you're not as passionate about uh, the purposes for which it needs to be done. And so sometimes God will put us on a shelf and just allow those things to be worked out in us so that they can come out of us the right way. Biblical example of this is John the Baptist. You see it in Mark and Matthew and in Luke and also in John 1. The last test of leadership is the promotion test. When a leader feels like he's not moving forward as fast as he would like to, you're in the promotion test. I've experienced this time and time again. When, God, when, when, when. The purpose of the promotion test is that God will send us through this for several reasons. Number one, because ultimately he wants us to trust him. God will send us through the promotion test because just like the self-will test, he wants us to die to self. But then also God will send us through the promotion test because sometimes we get what's called the destination disease. We get so focused on where we're trying to go that we really don't fully appreciate what God is doing right where we are. So God will send you through the promotion test to really also develop a sense of gratitude about where you are. And developing the appreciation for it is critical. Because if you have destination disease, it will always be the next thing. And then when you get the next thing, guess what? It's gonna be the next thing. And you will look up and your whole life will go by and you would have really failed to appreciate what God has been doing. Because it's not necessarily about the destination, it's more about the journey. It's not about where God is taking us to, it's what he's trying to do in us and through us, and that's what God is after. Biblical example of this is Abimelech in Judges chapter 9. Uh, and then I've also put Psalm 75 in your notes just to remind you that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west, but it comes from the Lord. And that's ultimately what God wants to remind us of in the promotion test. So there you have it. It was a lot that I tried to cram into um, this session, but I wanted you to understand it. I wanted you to to understand what those tests are, because if you have a better understanding of what they are, then you have a leg up <clears throat> of how to handle them um, when you feel yourself encountering them. But once again, as I said in the top, you will not go through these in any particular order. The only pattern is that there is no pattern, right? And you will go through these over and over and over again. But if you know how to handle them, when they come up, you can pass the test and God will promote you and use you to a greater degree. So God bless you guys. I hope that this was a blessing to you. I um, hope that it added value to your life. And I'm excited about the kickoff of the Leadership Institute uh, in several weeks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Van, for spending a few minutes with us, guys. Uh, you know, I hope as you were listening, you heard yourself, you identified yourself in one of these, of these tests, because a lot of times we're either going into a test, we're in the middle of a test, or we're coming out of a test. And so 
if you feel like you're in a good place, get ready because you're probably getting ready to go into another season. And one of the best things we can do in these seasons, in these difficult tests, is to rally around with other leaders who have been through these tests or who are currently going. We get in a community of other leaders who can encourage us, can help point us in the right direction and help equip us to do uh, the things that get, the, learn the lessons that God is trying to teach us. And so that's part of the whole reason of why we're doing the Leadership uh, Institute. The Advanced Leadership Institute is designed to group like-minded people who are going through similar seasons, who are learning similar things so that we can encourage each other, we can learn from each other, and we can continue to get better with each other. So we're so excited. Van, thank you for spending a few minutes with us. Uh, it's been an amazing webinar, lots of notes. Again, if you joined us sometime during the session, we will be sending out a video replay. We will be sending out the notes afterwards so you can catch all that is in this. There's 15 points, so you may even want to just revisit and spend some time processing, reading some of those supporting stories and really identifying, okay, here's where I'm at, and then opening yourself up and saying, God, just teach me what I need to learn in this season so that I become a better, stronger, faster, more efficient, more effective leader. And so if you're interested in being a part of the Advanced Leadership Institute, we are kicking off in just a few weeks. We're going to get an official start date confirmed very, very soon and get that out to you via email. I'm going to post a link here in the chat box. Let me get this copied real quick. Copy that. All right. I posted a link here in the chat box. If you are interested in, in again, grouping together with other, other leaders, continuing to learn from each other, continuing to grow and be stronger and better together, I'd love for you to enroll in that Advanced Leadership Institute that's getting ready to kick off. And if you use the promo code SAVE25, we're going to knock 25% off of your registration. We want to make this as accessible as possible, uh, bring a lot of value to you for as little cost as possible. So let me tell you, if you joined just a few minutes earlier, maybe you haven't um, figured out or haven't heard what the Leadership Institute is, let me give you a quick snapshot before we run today. Again, if you have questions from today's topic, feel free to drop those questions in the chat box. I'm going to hang on for just a few minutes afterwards and answer any questions you may have. But the Advanced Leadership Institute that's getting ready to kick off in just a few weeks is really a 10-month deep dive leadership training with some of the most influential leaders that we are in relationship with. Folks like Dr. Kenneth Omer, Dr. Matthew Hester, DeAndre Salter, Dr. Sam Chan, Wayne and Maisha Chaney, Mar Martin Van Tilbor, Sean Lovejoy, uh, Zakia Larry, Dr. Nicola Beach, myself. Uh, listen, these are people who have been high level leaders in ministries, in corporations, entrepreneurs who have started things from the ground up and very successful executive coaches. Some of the best leaders we are in relationship with. And we just want to spend some time together every month going through these modules, uh, which are online based. They're very flexible schedule every week, so you can tweak it and work it into your schedule. There'll be some online modules. There'll be some book learning during the month. There'll be a re growing resource library that you can access. Uh, there's even going to be some closed Facebook uh, interactions going on, Facebook live sessions. So really just trying to create this community where we continue to learn and grow and be better together. So the original price of the Advanced Leadership Institute is $15.99 or $12 monthly payments of $149 per month. But if you use that SAVE25 promo code, I'm going to post the link one more time here in the chat window. If you'll use the promo code SAVE25, we're going to drop that payment to $1195.25 or 12 monthly payments of $115.69. So that's going to allow you to get in, saving a couple of hundred bucks already right off the top. And again, we're going to be spending time each and every month with those faculty members. We're so excited to have you be a part of it. I'm excited, honestly, 10, 11 months from now when we finish this program, we, you get your certificate of completion from Van Moody Ministries. I'm excited to hear the stories that you're going to have about the things that God has taught you about leading your family, about leading in corporations, leading your teams on your jobs, leading your entire company maybe, or even leading in the church that you lead. We're excited just to help you get better, help us learn as we, uh, as we partner together. So it's a very, very exciting opportunity. It's getting ready to kick off in the next couple of weeks, so I don't want you to miss that opportunity. Don't delay. I know sometimes you uh, you, you need to think about things and find yourself a week or two or three weeks later because of the busyness of life uh, before you remember it again, 
Uh, and I don't want you to miss the kickoff. So if you're even remotely contemplating it, let me encourage you, go ahead and click, click, click that link, take that step of faith and say, okay, God, I'm going to be all in for this next season. Uh, and I want to learn and I want to grow because he's going to do some amazing things through us uh, and in us as we partner together. So again, thank you so much for joining today's last the th three of three, the final webinar of our summer uh, intensive series, just trying to grow better as leaders as we get ready to launch this Advanced Leadership Institute. We are going to be sending out the video replay link. We are going to be sending out the notes afterwards. Um, so you'll have this as an ongoing resource you can look back to. So excited to have you here. If you have any needs or any questions, I'm typing my email address in the chat window now. There's my email address. So if you have any questions, any concerns, anything that you want to learn more about from today's webinar, um, the uh, just email me. Is there any way I can get the last replay sent out? Yes, Jennifer, email that email address. Uh, email me and let me know you want that would be July's webinar, and I'll, I'll find that email that was sent out, and I'll get that email sent back to you. Um, okay, guys, that's all we've got for today. It's 1 o'clock. I want to release you. We want to honor your time, start on time, and end on time, so I'm going to let you get back to your job. Hope If you're on a lunch break, hope you had a great lunch. If you're just enjoying the day, I hope you're having some beautiful weather as it rains here in central Alabama. So we're so glad that you spent a few minutes with us. May God bless you. May you have an amazing, amazing week. We look forward to seeing you the next time we see you. We look forward to seeing you at the kickoff of the Advanced Leadership Institute. God bless you, and we'll talk to you all soon.